about? This is an anonymous interview, June 16th, 2016. All right. So, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, uh, could you make it more specific? I mean, what, what, what aspect well, of me do you want to know? Let's pretend that we haven't really met before. How would you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is, once we get through that part, how would you introduce yourself? Well, it depends to what audience. Um, I'm many things many different parts. I was born in Poland and lived there for the first four years of my life and had to flee Poland because of World War II beginning and um, then went like a, a journey halfway around the world like like Ulysses when he when he was traveling back home except we didn't go we had no home uh, and we didn't know where we were going so uh, we ended up in Cape Town, South Africa, uh, quite by accident, uh, because my uncle got smallpox and um, we had to be in quarantine and we wouldn't be separated. There were 10 of us, 10 people traveling together, three generations. Uh, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, my mother, my father, my older sister and me, my mother's brother and his wife, his crazy wife and her two-year-old son and um, her brother and my grandmother's niece and that makes ten of us. So why did you say that she was crazy? What made her crazy? Oh, I don't know. She was very... Uh, I had a lot of trouble with her. I couldn't find a single good thing about her. I really struggled because I wanted to see something good. She had a strong life force, but she was mean. She was a mean daughter-in-law. She nagged the life out of her youngest son. She didn't like my sister and me. She always told us that we went to the bathroom too often, whatever we did. I think I've got urinary problems from her, through her because of that. Wow. Because it was always too, too long we took. Or just, nothing was good enough. And she also preferred, like my mother and my grandmother, she preferred men to women. And we were two girls, my sister and I. And I don't know if she was jealous of our youth and beauty, God knows. But she was quite a good-looking woman herself. Uh, but mean, very mean. Very mean. So would you say that, because I noticed that as we're as we're beginning our conversation, you started with this story of exodus from Poland. So yes. is this the defining narrative from which you come? Maybe in some ways, yes, because it didn't give me a good image of, of how people are kind to each other. Although there was something that kept them all together, but I think it was more fear that they were afraid to, to branch out on their own thing felt that being together was better, and maybe it was. And my mother loved her brother very much. Um, but that also changed with the years. Uh, it ended up that she was disappointed with her brother. It was not a, a, a story of close loving, of a close loving family, because I did um, um, Holocaust interviews myself. And the people always told me how kind the mother was and how kind the mother, the father was to them and how well they treated them. I don't know if they, they uh, t turned it around, but I certainly wouldn't have described everybody as kind. I would have described them, or would have described myself as being rather um, neglected, not abused, but neglected. Um, my sister was very sick and she got a lot of attention. She was really very sick. And um, and my father um, favoured her. And my mother was supposed to favour me, but my mother had a lot of boyfriends and she didn't have much time to give to me. But she was, uh, she was a very interesting person. Uh, and she got us out of Poland. If it wasn't for her, we would have remained there. And then I came to South Africa and it took me a long time to find a voice. Uh, many decades, 
uh, I didn't know there was anything wrong with me. I thought I was just normal and that everybody was unhappy, that people, life was just a, a struggle and everybody was unhappy. It took me years to discover that wasn't true. But I was in my 50s. And I married a man, um, I think I married him on rebound. Uh, there was another boyfriend I had. I was engaged to somebody else and I wasn't great at it bonding with people. Uh, I had three uh, girlfriends, but uh, I didn't share that much with them. I didn't share much with anybody. I used to share with my governess, my governess in Poland, who I, who, um, who I had to leave behind. She looked after me morning, noon and night. And uh, it was a custom, it was a social custom that uh, in that, in our social class, that uh, children were not looked after by their parents, like in Britain, but by governesses. And we had two, one for me and one for my sister. Well, so tell me about Truda. Is it Truda or Trudy? Truda. 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 I don't know if she was Polish or German, because a lot of um, German girls came and were governesses, but also a lot of Polish women were governesses. And... Um, I remember her as being very loving. She taught me how to do um, acrobat um, gymnastics and um, spent a lot of time with me. And I've got three photographs of her and me where I'm doing gymnastics. And she taught me a prayer, uh, which I still remember today. What's the prayer? The prayer is Polish. Um, but you don't understand Polish. It doesn't matter. Say it in Polish. In Polish, it's the Ciebie Boziu Rączki Podnosze, or... It means I lift up my little hands to you, God, for the well-being of my mother, my father, and my grandmother. And I think she said sister. I'm not sure if she added sister, but I added it over the years. And uh, I've added to it now to, en uh, to encompass um, the whole world, the peace of the whole world and everybody in it to be happy. And... Um, and I was very upset to lose her, but nobody helped me with that. It was like she disappeared, and I forgot that I loved her in a way. And then I only remembered later in life when I was in my 50s, when I started therapy. Did you ever try and get in touch with her? Yes, but I couldn't find her. Okay. By the time I looked, um, my parents were dead, and I didn't know her last name. And I advertised in Poland. Uh, with our nicknames, our Polish nicknames, but I never found her. I never saw her again. Mm -hmm. After she left, we left uh, our apartment. Uh, immediately when war was declared, my mother got into a taxi with my sister and I, and we drove off to where her mother lived. And my father went to pay his workers because it was the first of the month, first of September. And um, she wouldn't wait for him. Marched off, you know, and that was the last I ever saw of Truda. And um, and what else do you want to know? Well, so are there some are there some things that you smile when you remember them in your Exodus story? Were there things that happened as you made your way to a destination unknown that uh, that bring a smile to your face? I'm afraid not much made me smile. It was not very funny. It was um, everybody. Elsa, Elsa, Elsa was my grandmother's niece. She was um, unmarried, and she was she had no money, and she was low on the rung of of. I mean, she was treated abominably by my grandmother, and by the rest of the family, and she behaved very badly herself. She used to tell tales of my sister and me. She caught, caught me smoking. She told my parents. They hit me. Uh, you know, it was like a hierarchy. And my grandmother hit her. It was it was like a nightmare, a little bit like a nightmare. You know? There was a picture. It wasn't very funny. Well, there was a picture I noticed where she has the most disgusted look as she's looking at your grandmother. Yes, that's exactly, that, that's why a, I chose that picture yeah, in my memoir. I think yeah. as an outsider, that picture made me chuckle a little bit because it was just such, it was in such plain view what she was thinking. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and it was a picture, 
all the pictures I had of my grandmother, um, when my sister was sort of trying to snuggle into my, into her, uh, she sort of just stood there. Uh, and I felt sorry for her because, in actual fact, she lost her husband the year before the war. And um, she was a very helpless woman. Her parents died when she was young and passed away from sister to sister. And she was very pretty, but she lost her beauty, and I think her husband was unfaithful to her. And um, she, she, my grandmother was very mean also, because she was not kind. So why do you think they were so mean? And how did you, how did you cope with that and stay intact, or perhaps you didn't? Well, I didn't. I, I, um, I, lo I kind of stopped talking. I was really upset about it. Um, I think my father was a good man, but he, um, if I hadn't read his diary, which he kept throughout the war years, I wouldn't have known uh, how psychological he was and how introspective he was and how unhappy he was. Um, he hated leaving Poland. He, he really, um, he loved Poland. He was really attached to it. Um, uh, he had a father that he looked up to. Um, I've only got one picture of the father, but he didn't look a very kind man to me, the father. Um, I felt sorry for my father. He had this wife who was very attractive to other men and he loved her at first, but I think in the end he didn't love her that much, uh, which didn't surprise me, you know. Um, and in the end we kind of, he and I reconciled a little bit. Uh, can, and you, can you tell me about that? Well, he, um, we kind of, um, he kind of got more respect for me as time went by. And I, I liked music like he did, and we'd go to concerts, but he didn't talk to me very much. We'd sit in silence and listen to the music, which was fine, but it would have been nice to have, if he'd spoken to me a little bit more. His diary was his, was his um, confidant. Um, I don't know, what else can I tell you? Well, so how did you reconcile exactly? Well, he knew when he was dying, and the day he was he died, at 5.30 he called me and said he wanted to say goodbye, that he was going to die. So I went there, and he said goodbye, and he didn't say, I love you or anything like that. He just said, I'm, I'm going. So I said, well, where are you going? And he didn't answer me. And um, then he wanted to see my daughter, my older daughter, Terry, not the other two children, so my husband went to fetch the two, just Terry, and my second daughter never forgave me for not, I mean, I didn't, my husband actually went and fetched Terry, and he never thought of bringing Laura, who was just two years younger, or Martin, um, he just fetched Terry, and so she was upset that, that he didn't um, fetch her as well. And he died with a smile on his face as if he knew where he was going. And he seemed happy. And um, I think I could almost feel his spirit going up, you know. Uh, there's that very famous story, Cottage of Candles, where each of us has a candle uh, that we learned at Yitzhak, at, at the, uh, the Magid course. Mm -hmm. And it always haunted me, that story, about... Um, this man who was seeking for justice. And he discovered that his own candle was going out, this young man. And he tried to steal his neighbor's candle. He actually was pouring oil into his own candle from this neighbor. And so, uh, I don't know if it was God or somebody appeared and said, is that the justice you want? Is that your idea of justice? Um, it was a strange story. Um, I don't know how that's connected to my father, but I mean, my father, I think, was a very uh, just man, very mystical, um, not very practical.
once somebody was backing into him and I told him to honk. And he said, no, the other man can see me. But the other man didn't see him and he bashed into him and he just let him. It's a strange passive thing to do. Don't you think? <laughs> well, yeah, and it cost him a dent in his car, it sounds yes, like. <laughs> it, did. it did. Well, so how did you... So I heard you say before that you sort of survived all of this by just being very quiet. Yes, I was very quiet. Were there any were there any places in your were you quiet with everyone everywhere or were there places where your voice was more I never, audible? I never I never found mentors or anybody like that that helped me when I was little. Um, I don't know why. I, because I was too quiet. Mm -hmm. I just didn't connect. And then um, I became very pretty. So I had lots of boyfriends. And um, I got engaged and I broke my engagement and then I found another guy and then I got, um, I liked this one guy and he, I went out with him on my birthday and the week afterwards he got engaged to somebody else. I mean, it was really weird. And then I married my husband. Um, and... I did love him, but we were so different. Um, I think I loved him. Um, he was a diamond dealer, and he wanted to make lots of money. And I thought I wanted to be rich, because we were rich in Poland, but we lost all our money. But the money didn't bring me much happiness. And... Um, His quest for, he, he seemed to want money for its own sake. And I couldn't stay with him. And I, I actually, we got divorced. And uh, But I found it very difficult being on my own. I was very um, unworldly. Uh, but at that time, I had already gotten my PhD. So I was um, studying psychology and um, doing storytelling and... Um, and I was developing quite a nice practice, but during the period when we got divorced, for some reason I I lost interest in the making of the money, and I never and my practice went down, and I never really brought it up again, and uh, I never really made a lot of money, uh, which kind of makes me sad because I should have made more money. I mean, I had it in me to do it. But I didn't do it. I felt guilty about being rich. Um, and yet when I wasn't rich anymore, uh, eventually I missed it. Interesting. Yeah. So do you have, so do you have a, a secret self or a secret life inside, like somebody else that you know you are but hasn't come out yet? Yes, even though I'm, I'm 81 years old. It was like it's taken me... I had a, a um, I wrote a book, I wrote a memoir, and this was a very um, special moment for me, um, reading to these people, and I, and um, I could hear, I could feel they were listening to me, and I really did it well, and there were like 60, 70 people there, and they really liked, I could see, they, I could see they were totally entranced. Um, but it's a little late in my life. I don't know what to tell you. What what? Uh, there's a strength in me that I never used, uh, which is a pity. Well, so say more about that strength, like the secret self that you have. Well, I, I, when I want something, I go for it. You know, everything, um, everything I've ever wanted, I've gotten, except that I never found a, a, a companion, a love companion. And it's like almost, I haven't given up. I'm 81 and I still haven't given up of finding it. I don't know what this uh, I, I don't have, like, I can't give you a formula. I, I don't, formulas really exist. It's all kind of nebulous and so mystical. Go ahead. And, 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 uh, and is there a God or isn't there a God? Does God help us? I don't know. Uh, 
very strange. So can you describe the love of your life that you're waiting for? How will you recognize him? Well, that I'll feel understood and will understand him. That is a him. I, I wanted to love a woman, but I can't. It just doesn't seem to be... Um, I really like male energy. Um, and yet I don't like men all that much. I don't know. It's very strange. Um, and I haven't given up. Uh, but, you know, I'm human and I'm going to die fairly soon. I mean... I don't have much time left. Well, so tell me about your dream man. Somebody very kind and somebody very wise. Mostly kind. Kind. Kind is important. You can laugh. I think laughing is very important. And somebody who, has, who cares about humanity, who cares about other people. And that together we could do something. I'm not sure what, but just continue what I'm doing. Nothing great. What would be a, what would be your ideal first date? That we would be able to talk to each other for a long time without getting uncomfortable and without wanting to run away, mm -hmm. but wanting to stay and listen and, and tell and talk, which doesn't happen that often, certainly. Well, so how is it that you've managed to stay hopeful of finding this love for your entire life? I don't know. Maybe it's because of fairy tales. I, I love fairy tales from ever since I can remember. And in the fairy tales, you you know, the, 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 they're very different fairy tales. They're not only fairy tales like Cinderella. And even Cinderella can be looked at in many different ways. My favorite story was Hansel and Gretel. And I didn't realize how wise Gretel was until many decades. You know, she was quite, she actually uh, had a lot to do with their um, rescue from the forest. Can you say why? Well, she was the one that um, pushed the witch into the oven and she rescued her brother. And then when they came to the end of the forest, there was a lake. And um, and there was a duck swimming, and uh, she, they were looking for their father's home. And she was the one who knew that they should each go separately. The duck should fetch first the one and then the other one, because otherwise all, all three of them would be too heavy and they would drown. So she, she had a sort of a, a natural... Um, um, practical sense of, of how to live in the world and that's very important as well as brilliance and and, uh, and, uh, and being a leader in the world you have to know how to take care of yourself and those that you love well so in that story which character are you? Gretel Gretel of course Gretel Yes. Are you also the duck? But maybe the duck that rescues Gretel somehow uh, and helps uh, and helps her. Although I don't know what would represent the duck in my life. Uh, perhaps the the duck represents a man, a mate, um, who would be a witness to my life and who would cherish me and I would cherish him. It's not a very grand uh, wish. No, it's, it's a small wish. Mm -hmm. I'm not a brilliant person. I, you know, I never have, I'm not. I'm well, so how do you, how do you account for your survival in the face of some of the things that you have gone through? Because it's a life force that, that um, that carries me through and that's why it's so sad for me my, my granddaughter has now tried to take her life she uh, it saddens me that she would I hope it's just a temporary thing 
and that she will have that life force that I have that made me continue, that refused to give up on life. How did you get that? Maybe from my mother. She she had a kind of a life force that, that got her that um, she was the one that got us out of the country. She insisted on leaving. She and my aunt. My aunt that, that, that I can't find a good thing about. Aunt, you know, the two of them array, uh, uh, um, decided that we had to leave and all ten of us left. Was for them, it, we, the men wanted to stay in Poland because they loved their lives, their, the beauty of the land, the language, the, the people, even in spite of all the persecution that had been going on for centuries, for, uh, well, for a thousand years. There's a, uh, uh, um, there's a museum in Poland that traces the history of Poland for the last thousand years, Gentiles and Jews, and how they lived together and in some ways loved each other. And yet, look what happened in the end with the Holocaust, how, how the Poles treated the, the Jews. Although many of them have been um, uh, in the uh, Yad Vashem, they have been um, regarded as righteous Christians who did help Jews. Actually, the largest amount uh, existed in Poland, which is quite apart from the fact that there were more Jews in, uh, in Poland than anywhere else. But in fact, more, more, more Poles helped Jews than in any other country. Hmm. I don't think I knew that. Which is a strange statistic. Mm -hmm. Very much so. In view of, of how people view the Poles. Mm -hmm. In South Africa, you should hear how the Lithuanians talk about the Poles. I mean, they regard them worse than the Nazis. Well, so so getting back to the life force, so how have you used this life force in your life for the good? Like, what would you what would you say? You, how would you describe your footprint in this life? I don't know. I, I don't know if I can put it into words. With some of my patients that I helped mm -hmm. uh, as a psychoanalyst, I helped. I helped more people than I was helped myself. Maybe because I started so late. I started well in my forties, and because I, I, um, I was so. Um, I felt so unloved as a child, and that I think is very hard to heal seems to me that's very hard to heal. Well, I found it very hard to heal, um, to turn it around, uh, to, to feel lovable and being able to love. So do, was your psychoanalytical practice and the psychodrama practice that you have, did those heal you as well? The psychodrama helped me a lot, more even than the psychoanalysis. The psychodrama because in psychodrama you can't lie, um, you just can't, because it's it's visual and you act it out, and uh, it's actually an amazing uh, modality, discovered by a crazy man called Moreno, and Freud was also crazy but brilliant, both men were brilliant, both were born in Vienna, not born but they lived and worked mm -hmm. in Vienna, and um, I think psychodrama is a wonderful thing. Uh, and I would like to see it uh, used more in, in the um, psychotherapeutic world. So do you have a particular memory of something that you did in psychodrama that was a pivotal moment for you? Well, yes. My, my sister, who I, who I despised in many ways, I discovered that I was extremely jealous of her. Um, my, the director, my teacher, my mentor, um, was very. Uh, she she did a scene where I had to watch my parents take care of my sister, and suddenly I sat on the ground and I said, I wasn't sick, but I I said I've got earache out of the blue, and I suddenly realised how 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 envious I was of my sister and all the attention she was getting. Um, 
and that made me realize um, that even my the fact that my sister was uh, not somebody I aspired to be, and yet I was so jealous of her for her we for her weakness in a way her her. I think that's where I discovered that, or I thought I, I made a false discovery that in order to be noticed, you had to be sick. Uh, there had to be something wrong with you, and that held me back, I think. Uh, so it was, but I discovered it too late um, in my life to really utilize it and do more in the world. I would have liked to have done more in the world, I think. So what would you what what would you have liked to do that you haven't done? To have helped other people more. Um, to have cared more for for other people's welfare. But it came to me late in life. Do you think it's too late? No, it's not too late. But uh, I would have had a more satisfying life, I think, if I'd mm -hmm. done more for other people. So what is the thing that you're most proud of? Oh, I don't know. Most proud of. Um, I don't know. Something to do. You know, I always liked P uh, Keats's um, poem, Beauty is Truth and Truth is Beauty. Uh, and my mother told a lot of, didn't, she didn't tell lies, but she was very secretive. And it w my mother must have been very beautiful because she had all these lovers but she was secretive and after I discovered that she was secretive I stopped seeing her as beautiful I don't know how that's connected with my life there's something about that, that phrase beauty is truth and truth is beauty that is all you have in the world and all you need to know something like that that it goes something about that so how does that connect to being proud of yourself? I don't know. I, I, I can't answer that. Um, my mother attributed too much importance to her own beauty. And I think I did too. And that um, it's inner beauty that counts. And um, and for uh, for people to realize that um, I don't know I can't I can't give you any words of wisdom as such. Well, so if we circle if we come back to what you feel that you are proud of, like what is your accomplishment in the world, or maybe more than one. Well, I'm very proud of my memoir that I managed to write up mm -hmm. and, and 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 really put a lot of of truths into it, my own truths. It's not complete. I, I, I would like to write some more because I think more needs to be written. Um, what else What else would you like to write? Well, to um, things that are secretive to myself, to, to unburden myself of my own secrets. Can you name one or two things that you would love to release and be free of? If I knew what they were, I would have done it long ago. Uh, <laughs> it's not so easy. It's not so easy. Um, life isn't so simple. There's no magic formula. There is no magic formula. There's hard work, hard work. Uh, it's not so much brilliance as, as perseverance and perspiration, working hard and enjoying yourself hard. You know, and mm -hmm. having yeah, fun yeah. and laughing a lot. So, in addition to the memoir, are there other things that you're proud of as well? I'm proud of my children. I'm proud of my um, two daughters. I'm not that proud of my son. He doesn't seem to have um, remorse over some of the things he's done. Uh, but my daughters are quite brilliant and very... Um, aware of um, people that are less well off than themselves. They've got a strong sense of social justice and the men they've married mm -hmm. have as well. 
I'm very proud of that, that somehow in spite of me being so um, ill-equipped in many ways to be a mother, that I did a good enough job of well, bringing them up. So if you were going, if someone appeared before you who was a victim or perhaps just learning how to survive and they asked you for help so that they could thrive, what would you tell them if they asked for your help and advice? Um, to recognize who they were and to utilize the gifts that they'd been given by God. And what if they don't know what those are? To find out what they are. That everybody has something that they that's special about them. So but I think we come on to the, into the world. I'm not quite sure what, what my speciality was, but that we all come in with certain abilities and to use them before it's gone, before your life is over. So if they don't know what they are, is there a particular way that they can discover them? Well, by, by not rushing around too much, uh, devoting time to think. Um, I think having some kind of religious affiliation helps. Because religion is not bad. It's the way we've used it that's bad. But mm. it's, it, religion is a good thing. And we all seem to come to it. Thinking people seem to come to it in old age. So there must be something in it. Wiser people than me have believed in God. So how does your religion and your relationship with God help you now? To be a decent person. It helps you. It gives you a formula for how to live. And not just to do things because you feel like it, but because that's the right way to, to live. That's um, a good way to, to, to be alive and, and help others. So how would you describe your relationship to God at this point? At this moment in time, it's pretty good, but it doesn't. It's not always good. It it comes and it goes. But um, I, I can't be more specific than that. Also, if you were going to live in a fairy tale, which fairy tale would you choose? Um. I think I like the fairy tale of Vasilisa the Beautiful. It's a, fairy, a Russian fairy tale where a little girl, her mother is dying and she's eight years old and her mother takes a doll out from under the bed and she gives the little girl the doll and she says, if ever you're in trouble, feed the doll first and then the doll will help you. And... Uh, it isn't, there's a lot more to the story and she's got all kinds of tasks but that part of it has always remained in my mind that if ever I'm in trouble to first eat something and then my adult self will be able to be better equipped to take care of the frightened child and would that have helped me a lot so feed the child first no feed yourself first ah Sort of like being on an airplane where you have to put your yes, mask on first. Right. Interesting. Yes. yes, and then you're able to, to, to take care of somebody else. You have to feed yourself first. So is there anything that you would say to someone who feels as if life is too hard and they want to give up? What would you say to that person? I would say to them that life is actually very beautiful most of the time. And that we, yes, we do get trials and tribulations, and it's hard to understand why. Um, but that most of the time life is beautiful. If you're just able to see the beauty and enjoy the, the humor and, 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 the, and how funny we all are running what? around like flies, you know, trying to do like God knows what. Well, what just do you, enjoy life. So what do you find the most beautiful? The sun is beautiful, the sun, the sky, the mountains, the sea, uh, flowers, flowers are beautiful, the colors of the flowers, I mean, that's exquisite. Any last words? <laughs> no, I don't have any last words. So if this were your last day, what would you do with it? What would I do with it? Oh my God, no. I'm not 
to even do something as mundane as eating a wonderful meal. So if this were your last day, what would you do? I don't know. I think I've told you enough. <laughs> I don't know if it's enough. I don't know. A wonderful meal, perhaps. Or maybe a wonderful sexual experience. <laughs> Yes, or something, um, or reading a wonderful book that moves me very much, uh, or listening to a beautiful piece of music, mm. or having a conversation with God, mm. and for once God would answer me. <laughs> very nice. <laughs> there you have it.